Welcome to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to make you a better ER nurse. Today, we are covering bradycardia. We are going to go over what it is and when do we actually care about a low heart rate. We'll touch on symptoms and spend most of the time going over treatments and nursing tips. At the end, we'll discuss causes and of course, we'll end the video with the question of the day. So, what is bradycardia? Bradycardia is a heart rate less than 60. However, in the ER, we care mostly about symptomatic bradycardia, where the heart rate is low to the point where it is affecting perfusion. This goes back to the principle of needing to decide whether a patient's whether patients are unstable or stable. And symptomatic bradycardia is definitely unstable. In my experience, symptoms start manifesting with heart rates around two or less than 40. And if the heart rate is in the 30s, and specifically if it's in the 20s, you need to start acting. If the heart rate is that low, like in the 20s, and your BP is still holding, don't trust the blood pressure holding because it won't be long before the blood pressure starts to drop. The way it was explained to me was that the patient's own catecholamine release maintains the blood pressure up, but once it wears off, the blood pressure will tank. So you have to be proactive and get ahead of it. We'll discuss the treatments in a bit. So with bradycardia, there can be different rhythms like sinus bradycardia, then there's the blocks like complete heart blocks or Mobitz types 1 or 2, and there's other rhythms, but we'll focus on those for now. Now, let's get into some of the symptoms. So, as we said, we care about symptomatic bradycardia, and these symptoms are as a result of poor perfusion. So, your patients can present with fatigue, syncope, altered, short of breath, with chest pain, and a low blood pressure, just to name a few. Again, symptoms are a result of there being a compromise to perfusion, hence, shock is starting to manifest. Now, let's go into the treatments. What are we going to do when we receive a symptomatic bradycardic patient? Of course, as with any other patient, let's start off with the ABCs. If you want to go more in depth on the ABCs, please watch my video on them. Now, besides the ABCs, there are some basic things that need to occur for every sick patient. And these are getting them on the monitor so you can get a quick set of vital signs as well as take a look at their rhythm. Besides that, you need to get an IV as soon as possible because a lot of critical care medications need IV access to be given, especially here with symptomatic bradycardia. Oxygen administration depends, are they hypoxic? But even if they're not hypoxic, if your patient is syncopizing, throw them on a quick non rebreather unless they are fully out. At that point, someone needs to be on their airway with a bag valve mask. Now, specifically to symptomatic bradycardia, you're going to need to grab the crash cart, connect the pacing pads in an anterior pos posterior position, connect the three leads ECG, and prepare medications like atropine, epinephrine, or dopamine, among others. I included the ECG here because it's important to get. Although you'll find that in those moments when patients are, arrive very sick, there just isn't time to get one. So you're going to have to go by the rhythm on the cardiac monitor. However, an ECG is still very important and you should do everything possible to get one early on. So typically what happens is atropine is given first since it will be readily available in your crash cart. Dosing is 1 milligram every 35 minutes up to a max of 3 milligrams. However, even though you got the atropine on board, you still need to be on the move. And this means ensuring the pacer pads and leads are correctly on the patient, as well as preparing other medications like an epinephrine drip. Atropine won't, much, won't have much of an effect on complete heart blocks. And even though it may still be given, you should prioritize getting ready for pacing as soon as possible for complete heart blocks or Mobitz type 1 and Mobitz types 2. So don't forget that. So with pacing or transcutaneous pacing, it will be used with heart blocks, with heart blocks, especially complete heart blocks. And even with sinus bradycardia, if the medications are not working and the patient is still exhibiting signs of shock. As we discussed, keep in mind to ensure that the pads are placed in an anterior posterior position and that the three lead ECG is connected. Know that when checking for a pulse while a patient is getting paced, you have to check either in the lower extremities or in the fem. 
I prefer the fan. Also, transcutaneous pacing is not permanent. Although it will help stabilize your patient, something more permanent like a transvenous pacer will need to be put in. Also, keep in mind that getting paced is very, very painful. So you may end up giving your patient something for pain or sedation. Here, I just wanted to list some of the medications you may see when caring for patients with symptomatic bradycardia. We've discussed atropine, but to summarize, it will be given first as it is readily available. It won't have much of an effect on second or third degree heart blocks, so prioritizing pacing in those patients. And you, wouldn't, and you shouldn't give it in patients having a myocardial infarction because although it will increase the heart rate, it will also increase myocardial oxygen demand further damaging the heart then you also have epinephrine and dopamine which are pressures that help increase the heart rate and strength of contraction if you want to go more in depth on pressures please watch my video on them then you also have calcium glucagon and high dose insulin these medications are used for beta blocker and calcium channel blocker overdose just remember that for just symptomatic bradycardia, ACLS, you're going to have atropine, epinephrine, dopamine, and the pacing. You add on the calcium, the glucagon, and all these other medications when you figure out what is the cost. But in the beginning, just straight ACLS, it's atropine, and then it's going to be either transcutaneous pacing or the epinephrine and dopamine. But as we discussed, you give the atropine first while you're getting all these other things ready, like the pacing, placing the pads on, and getting like epinephrine and dopamine ready. And then homework for you is going to be what medication is given for digoxin toxicity? Again, what medication is given for digoxin toxicity? Now let's go into some nursing tips. You should take the time even on an off day to go and review how to use a defibrillator and all of its functions, as well as take the time to get to know your crash cart opening up every drawer and knowing exactly where things are at. Remember, when pacing, the pads need to be in an anterior posterior position. And then don't forget to give Zofran before giving glucagon, because if you don't, your patient will be vomiting everywhere. You should also take the time to review how to make an epinephrine drip or at least have it written down somewhere. So when you need it, you can easily access it. Finally, for your super sick patients, peri-arrest bradycardia is something you will come across and it's scary. Within a matter of seconds and minutes, your patient's heart rate will drop, drop, and drop some more. At this point, you need to act, call the team, tell them to come in and get some epi ready. Now, super quick, let's go over some of the causes you need to be aware of. Bottom line, although knowing all the interventions we talked about is important, if we cannot figure out the reason for the patient's bradycardia, they won't be appropriately treated long term, which is why performing a good HMP is important, knowing what medications they take, what kind of medical problems they have, etc, etc. So from the top, you have calcium channel blocker overdose, beta blocker overdose, digoxin toxicity, inferior myocardial infarction, hypoxia, hyperkalemia, organophosphate toxicity, and hypothermia. There are many more other causes for symptomatic bradycardia, but for a new grad just starting out on the ER, just focus on these for now. Alrighty, now let's go into the question of the day. Before giving thrombolytics, what are the blood pressure parameters? In other words, when is the blood pressure too high and you have to give a BP lowering medication? Thank you for your time today. I hope that I was at least able to teach you one thing. If you want to keep learning, I've listed my favorite ER nursing related books in the description with my favorite being Sheehy's and the case files. As well, please take the time to watch my other videos. Also, if you would like to help support the channel, I have nursing stickers and shirts on Redbubble that you can check out again. Thank you for your time today. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.